How's it going everybody? I thought it might be helpful to do an updated little primer on Home Assistant to go along with my Garden Rebuild series as a reference, so as quickly as I can I'm going to run through all the different tabs and menus in Home Assistant, I'll tell you the ones that I spend most of my time in, and talk about some of the core functionality and terminology in Home Assistant that you should know. Things like what is an entity, or what is templating, or what are the three elements that make up an automation, and how are automations different than scripts. I'm going to demo this on my working system so you can see what it looks like with stuff actually somewhat set up. So this overview tab on the left is the default dashboard that the system has. It allows you to add different cards to show whatever you want, whether it's toggles that you can use to turn things on and off, or graphs, or gauges, or text readouts of your sensors. There are several different types of cards to choose from to display your info. You can add multiple views on each dashboard and put different cards on these views to organize things better, and you can even create multiple dashboards if you'd like. The energy tab can be used to track your energy usage. I don't currently use this one, but it wouldn't be a bad idea. The map tab shows you the location of any tracked devices in your system. Since I'm just using Home Assistant for my basement garden, I don't ever use this map tab. Logbook keeps a record of all the changes that have happened in your system in reverse chronological order, so the newest stuff shows up at the top. I rarely look in here unless I'm trying to troubleshoot something weird. History lets you look back in time at the state of all the different virtual and physical bits and pieces of your system. By default, most of your data will be available in history, but you can choose to specifically include or exclude things by modifying your configuration file. There are add-ons available to create nicer looking graphs that you have more control over and can display on your dashboard, like the InfluxDB database in conjunction with Grafana. ESP Home and File Editor are two add-ons that I installed in the last video I made, and I spend quite a bit of time inside each of these. ESP Home gives you a very easy way to program and flash all of your ESP microcontrollers like 8266s or ESP32s. File Editor, as you may have guessed, allows you to edit your Home Assistant files directly. The absolute most important file you will edit is the configuration.yaml file, but you can edit a number of other ones as well, like your automations or scripts files. You can build automations and scripts using the editors in the UI, which I'll show you later, or via text in their respective files here. This text you see is in YAML format, which stands for YAML Ain't Markup Language. YAML is dependent on proper indentation, so if something isn't spaced properly, the file editor will balk at it. You can create all sorts of things in this config file that will then become part of your system, like sensors, and sensors don't actually have to be physical sensors. You can create a sensor called a template sensor that gets its value based on what you tell it, whether it takes the average of two physical sensors, or does some math on an input you provide, or whatever. You can also add a variety of different inputs called helpers, like text inputs, or drop-down menus, or timers, or date time inputs. These are all ways to help you get your data into this system. Creating inputs here is the same as adding them in the helper section, which we'll see in a bit, except I prefer adding them in the config file because it's easier to add a lot of them by copy pasting, and it's easier to customize them here in my opinion. When I write a new helper in here and then save and restart Home Assistant, it'll poof into existence and I can then add it onto my dashboard so that I can interact with it. I don't use the media tab for my garden, and hacks was another add-on installed in the last video. This is where you can add community-created custom elements like the scheduler that I use. There are a couple very useful sections in the developer tools tab, and I'm in here all the time. The state section lets you see the current state of all your entities in Home Assistant, as well as their attributes. You can also manually set the state of things if you want to do some testing for some of your automations. Services allows you to call services, which are all the different types of actions Home Assistant can do. You could manually turn a light on, for example, by calling light.turnon. I almost never use this services section and just put toggles and buttons on my dashboard to call the services for me. Template is the other section that I use very often when I'm setting up scripts or automations. This tool lets you render and test your templates in real time to see if they work and to get them acting exactly how you want them to. You flesh them out in here and then you plug the working version into your code in places like the configuration.yaml file. You'll know something is a template in Home Assistant if it's surrounded by these sets of curly braces that you see here. This syntax is called Jinja, and you can learn more about it by clicking this link. So what are templates for? Well, a template can serve as sort of a placeholder, and you can fill it with whatever data you'd like. You can use templates to access the current state or attributes of different entities in your system, and use this to do all sorts of cool things. Here's an example of a template sensor I built in my config file to calculate vapor pressure deficit. So in each one of my tents I have a humidity sensor, I have an ambient air temperature sensor, and I have an infrared leaf temperature sensor. I need the values of every one of these sensors to calculate my VPD, so I created this template sensor called T1 Leaf VPD that grabs all these values, does a bunch of math based on the equation to calculate VPD, and then spits out the results in KPA. Every time the state of any of these three physical sensors changes, the template does all the checks and math and then publishes the result, which I'm showing with these gauges here on my dashboard. I can also use this result to automate other things like exhaust fans or humidifiers. 
Templates are also nice for formatting messages or notifications. If something goes wrong, I could have the system send out a notification that says something like, hey, the pH of station one reservoir is states sensor.s1 underscore pH, and I'll get my value plugged in there. You can template in a lot of useful information to your messages. Templates are probably the most rewarding thing to learn in Home Assistant. Once you get good at them, you'll love them. Events is where you can fire an event on the event bus or listen for one. As mere users, you and I don't really need to know this stuff, but this section gives you a glimpse behind the curtain at what's called the event bus, which is the core of everything that is Home Assistant. Many different parts of Home Assistant are firing off events all the time, and many other parts are listening for specific events to occur, so they can all do their jobs in the background. For example, every second that ticks by produces a time-changed event that goes out on the bus. Or if the state of a sensor changes, this gets sent out as a state-changed event on the event bus with a whole bunch more information like what the name of the sensor is, what the prior state was, and what the new state is. I rarely use this event section, but I do on occasion so I can get a look at the structure of certain events so I can pull out the bits of info I want to use for templates. This is probably the third time I have ever looked in statistics. Okay, the configuration tab. Any updates that become available will be visible at the top. Home Assistant Cloud is where you can sign up for a paid subscription that will give you easy remote access to your Home Assistant instance and grant you some additional powers like being able to connect voice assistants like Google Assistant or Amazon Alexa. The Devices and Services tab is a very important one. This is where you add integrations and manage your devices, entities, and areas. Integrations are how Home Assistant connects and integrates with devices, services, and more. An integration contains all the code and smarts to be able to easily bring something into Home Assistant and work with it without ever having to see any of that smart stuff. There are tons of integrations from third-party vendors available, plus there are also built-in integrations that are already working in Home Assistant behind the scenes, like the sensor, light, or switch integration. Devices can be thought of as groups of entities, and entities are single control points or data points. This Tuya power bar would be considered a device, and the five controllable outlets on it are each their own separate entity. Every entity gets an important system name assigned to it called an entity ID, which will be in lowercase and separated with underscores rather than spaces, and you'll see these entity IDs a lot in your automations and scripts or adding stuff to your dashboard. Areas are a way that you can group all your entities together just to better organize your system based based on where they're located. Automations and scenes is next. In here you'll find your automations, scenes, scripts, and helpers. Automations are of course very important in Home Assistant. You can create them from scratch or you can create them from a blueprint which is sort of a template for an automation where you just plug in the specific entities you have in your system and the rest is done for you. Every automation has three components. Triggers, conditions, which are optional, and actions. Triggers are what start the automation. Triggers can be of many different types like a numeric state where if the entity you've specified goes above or below a certain number the trigger fires. It could be a state where if something goes to a certain state like on or off it fires. It could be a time like noon or a time pattern like every 90 minutes. If you have multiple triggers, if any of these triggers happen, the automation moves to the next step. When a trigger fires, the next thing that happens is if you have a condition listed, the system will evaluate whether or not that condition has been met. I could have a condition that said some other switch must be in the on state, or it must be after five o'clock or something like that. If this condition is not met, the automation dies here and the action never happens. If you have multiple conditions, they must all be true for the automation to proceed. If a single one is not true, the automation dies. If there's no conditions or all existing conditions are met, the automation moves on to the last stage, which is the action. There are plenty of different actions, but the one you'll use probably 90% of the time, at least in my case, is call service. Call service is what you use to control your stuff, just like the section we saw in the development tools area. You can do things like a switch turn off to kill power to an outlet or relay, or do a light turn on or a fan set speed, things like that. This is how you make changes to the devices that are tied to your system. You can have multiple actions and include delays between them. Scenes are sort of like presets where the state of all the entities you include is saved. You might want three lights to be on, two lights to be off, and a specific outlet to be on. You'd add these entities, save the scene when they were all in the state that you wanted, and then anytime you wanted all of these entities to go back to that state, you could call the scene. Scripts are sequences of actions that run from top to bottom. 
it's essentially just like the actions component of the automation section, but they're not necessarily watching for something to trigger them. You need to trigger the script yourself somehow, whether it's by pressing a button that you've created or making it part of the action of an automation even. In my old system, I had a script that would turn on a pump to fill a reservoir with fresh water, then it would wait until a certain volume of water was reached, it would kill that pump and then start dosing it with nutrients by controlling all the different pumps in sequence with delays in between each so the newts had time to mix. Like I mentioned earlier, helpers is another place you can add stuff that helps you get your input into the system. Again, blueprints are cookie cutter automation templates that you can steal from the community and just plug your specific entities into. The add-ons, backups, and supervisor section is where you install add-ons like the last video I showed, as well as create, download, or restore backups. It's a good idea to automate your backups if you can. And system is where you see all the info about your Pi and any errors that might be thrown. You can also do a full reboot or shutdown of the Pi itself here. You manage your dashboards here, there's a section for NFC tags or QR codes here, which I think would be cool to implement in my garden in the future. The people in zones doesn't really matter much to me since I'm not tracking my presence or anybody else's. And finally, you have settings which gives you access to system logs and a handful of other things. This server control section is especially handy because you can restart Home Assistant here and also reload different YAML configurations. You'll find sometimes when you make a change to something that the change doesn't take effect right away. So you can either restart Home Assistant or you might be able to get away with just reloading something from this menu. So for example, if you edit an automation and it's not acting the way that you would expect it after saving it, try reloading it here and see if that works. Finally, there are a few user options that you can configure by clicking your username in the bottom left corner. If you're not able to see something that you see me messing with in my videos, try turning on the advanced mode if you haven't already, and that'll probably fix it. Okay guys, that's it for this one. I hope some of this was useful to you. If it was, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel, and we will see you on the next one.